on World News Tonight. Climate calamity. India drowns as heavy rains wipe out towns and villages. Mass kidnapping. Hostage situation in Haiti as over a dozen Americans plead for release. Mandate showdown. Workers protest against President Biden's COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Swish and flick. The Potterheads celebrate 20 years of existence with a Hogwarts charm. From the global resources of the Verona Media Network, this is Other Verona World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with severe weather that has struck India. At least 24 people have been killed in floods in southern India after heavy rains caused rivers to overflow, cutting off towns and villages. For more on this, we have our Dharana World News special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekara reporting now from Delhi in India. Gayatri. Yes, Anuradi, five children are among the dead. There are fears the death toll could rise further as many people are missing. Several houses were washed away and people became trapped in the district of Kotayam in Kerala state. Kotayam and Iduki are two of the worst affected districts in the state. Days of heavy rainfall has also caused deadly landslides. Military helicopters are being used to fly in supplies and personnel to areas where people are trapped, officials said. Thousands of people have been evacuated and more than 100 relief camps have been set up across the state, Kerala's Chief Minister Pinarai Vijayan stated. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India. Southeast Asian countries will invite a non-political representative from Myanmar to a regional summit this month, delivering an unprecedented snub to the military leader who led the coup against Myanmar's elected civilian government. The leader of the military junta that has ruled Myanmar since its coup will not be invited to a top diplomatic summit for the region. And it represents a rare snub for the leader from the Southeast Asian country. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, agreed to the move at an emergency meeting on Friday. The move is seen as unprecedented. Myanmar's army chief Min Ang Line led the coup against the country's elected civilian government in February. But the ASEAN bloc is consensus-driven, and Friday's decision marks a rare bold step for it. ASEAN traditionally favours a policy of engagement and non-interference. The bloc says it will invite a non-political representative from Myanmar instead. Singapore's foreign ministry said on Saturday the move to sideline Myanmar's military chief was a difficult but necessary decision to uphold ASEAN's credibility. The statement went on to cite the lack of progress made on a roadmap to restore peace in Myanmar that the military had agreed to with the bloc in April. ASEAN's current chair Brunei said some member states had received requests from Myanmar's national unity government, formed by opponents of the army, to attend the summit. The bloc has faced increasing international pressure to take a tougher stand against Myanmar. It was criticised in the past for its ineffectiveness in dealing with leaders accused of rights abuses, subverting democracy and intimidating political opponents. More than 1,000 civilians have been killed by Myanmar's security forces and thousands arrested, according to the United Nations, amid a crackdown on strikes and protests. The military says those estimates of the death toll are exaggerated and blames foreign interference for their exclusion. We have some breaking news. Colin Powell, the first black U.S. Secretary of State and top military officer, died at the age of 84 from COVID-19 complications. Powell's family said in a post on his Facebook page that he was fully vaccinated and extended thanks to the medical staff at the Walter Reed National Medical Center for their caring treatment, ending the statement by saying they have lost a remarkable and loving husband, father, grandfather and a great American. As a four-star army general, he was chairman of the military's Joint Chiefs of Staff under President George H.W. Bush during the 1991 Gulf War, in which U.S.-led forces expelled Iraqi troops from neighboring Kuwait. Powell, a moderate Republican and a pragmatist, later served as Secretary of State under President George W. Bush. 
16 Americans and one Canadian citizen on a missionary visit were kidnapped near Port-au-Prince while visiting an orphanage. Armed gangs are believed to control about half the city, with killings and kidnappings on the rise since Haiti's president was assassinated in July. Tonight, the turmoil and violence rocking Haiti has been directed at American citizens. After 17 people on a missionary visit were kidnapped near the capital of Port-au-Prince while visiting an orphanage. The Ohio-based Christian Aid Ministries posting on its website the group of 16 U.S. citizens and one Canadian citizen includes five men, seven women, and five children. Join us in praying for those who are being held hostage. The terror, nothing new. This taxi driver saying the effects of kidnapping, people do not go out into the streets. We cannot find people to transport. Armed gangs are believed to control about half the city of Port-au-Prince, with killings and kidnappings on the rise since Haiti's president was assassinated in July. Haitian police say the kidnappings were carried out by the same group, 400 Mawozo, that abducted five French priests and two nuns months earlier. The conditions in Haiti worsened by a deadly August earthquake, prompting thousands to flock to the Texas border weeks ago, seeking refuge. Professor Eduardo Gamara is an expert on Latin American relations. There's no police, there's no military, there hasn't been a military for decades. So, so who do you go to to say, I just, I've just been kidnapped? Tonight, American citizens trying to lift up the suffering, desperately in need of help themselves. Japan's new prime minister insisted that the Japanese government's plan of releasing millions of tons of radioactive water into the ocean from Fukushima nuclear plant cannot be delayed. Fumio Kishida's remarks are likely to anger Japan's neighbors who have repeatedly urged Tokyo to reconsider its plans. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has reiterated the planned mass disposal of wastewater stored at the tsunami-wrecked Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant cannot be delayed any further. During his first visit to the facility since taking office early this month, Kishida stressed his government will further exert efforts to reassure local residents about the technical safety of the disposal project. The Japanese government and TEPCO, the operator of the plant, have announced plans to begin releasing the water into the Pacific Ocean from the spring of 2023, a project they say will be carried out over decades. The plan has faced fierce opposition from fishermen, local residents, as well as neighboring countries like South Korea and China. Against this backdrop, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency has vowed to hold close consultations with South Korea and other countries in regards to Tokyo's plan. South Korea's foreign ministry says such a pledge was made during the IAA chief's meeting with Seoul's deputy foreign minister for multilateral affairs, Ham sang woo The ministry explained that Ham expressed Seoul's concerns, calling on the UN nuclear watchdog to play a constructive role to try and resolve the issue. The intelligence agency at the Pentagon is warning North Korea may resume long-range ballistic missile text tests next year and believes the regime is unlikely to give up its weapons of mass destruction. A special envoy for negotiations for the North also says that if Pyongyang decides to keep its nuclear weapons, then so will neighboring countries. The U.S. Department of Defense Intelligence Agency has released an in-depth analysis on North Korea's military power, including its nuclear weapons and missiles. In its report on Friday, the intelligence agency said that it's unlikely that Pyongyang will give up all of its weapons of mass destruction, adding that North Korea leaders view nuclear arms as critical to the regime's survival. It also warned that Pyongyang may resume long-range ballistic missile tests next year, as it will probably focus on training and improving its missile forces. This includes improving its solid fuel ballistic missiles, which can be prepared for launch faster than missiles using liquid fuel. The Defense Intelligence Agency believes that the ultimate goal of North Korea is integrating a nuclear weapon with a ballistic missile and enabling that nuclear-armed missile to operate reliably. However, the specific basis for the report's assumptions has not been clearly disclosed. Meanwhile, Joseph Detrani, the former special envoy for negotiations with Pyongyang, also commented on North Korea's nuclear weapons. He said there is appropriate concern that other nation states will try to acquire nuclear weapons mainly for deterrence purposes. If North Korea is permitted to retain its nuclear weapons, South Korea, Japan and others in the region may decide to own them as well despite U.S. nuclear deterrence commitments. Detrani stressed that if the world wants to ensure that other countries do not pursue their own nuclear weapons programs, two conditions must be met. 
ensuring that Iran doesn't acquire a nuclear weapon and that North Korea denuclearizes completely and verifiably. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Next year's Beijing Games has triggered protests over China's human rights record. But the International Olympic Committee's point man for the event, Juan Antonio Samaranch, said the multi-sport extravaganza is about bringing people of youth together. The countdown to the Beijing Olympics has begun, and so have protests against the event over China's record on human rights. Activists gathered in Athens over the weekend, shouting boycott Beijing 2022, a day before the lighting of the Olympic flame. Beijing is set to become the first city to host both a summer and winter games after hosting the Olympics in 2008. But human rights groups say no improvements have been made over the past 14 years. The controversy has prompted the International Olympic Committee to defend the upcoming games. Spokesperson Juan Antonio Samaranch said Sunday, the Olympics are about uniting young people from around the world. Uh, yeah, everybody has the right to, is entitled to their ideas, their positions and their principles. Uh, what I have to say is we cannot comment on those protests. There were some protests uh, uh, today in Athens. We cannot comment on those things. We are here in, in ancient Olympia for a very important thing, which is getting everybody together from all parts of the world. Rights groups and some American lawmakers have called on the IOC to relocate the event unless China ends what the U.S. deems to be genocide of Uyghur Muslims. Chinese authorities have been accused of facilitating forced labor by detaining around a million Uyghurs and other primarily Muslim minorities in camps. China denies wrongdoing, calling the camps vocational training centers aimed at combating extremism. Beijing is also contending with the threat of the global health crisis and has banned international visitors. But unlike the Tokyo Games earlier this year, local fans will be allowed to attend Olympic events. Now on to the updates of the COVID crisis. President Biden has issued a vaccine mandate across the U.S., but many American workers, both vaccinated and unvaccinated, are standing up against his decision. Our body, our choice. A popular slogan used by hundreds of U.S. workers over the Biden administration's push to enforce vaccine mandates. On Friday, some 200 employees from aerospace company Boeing staged a protest over its plans to require workers to get vaccine shots. Boeing said earlier in the week that 125,000 of its employees must be vaccinated by December 8th, citing President Joe Biden's executive order that requires federal contractors to be vaccinated. In September, the Biden administration directed the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to issue a rule requiring private companies with 100 or more workers to vaccinate their staff or test those who aren't vaccinated at least once a week. The U.S. Labor Department on Tuesday submitted the initial text of Biden's vaccine mandate plan. If it's passed, it will apply to more than 130,000 businesses. Americans who are against vaccinations have been showing their disapproval. And the state governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, has decided to block businesses from requiring inoculations or doing regular tests on the unvaccinated. To that, the country's top infectious disease health expert, Anthony Fauci, said the governor's decision was really unfortunate. While speaking to Fox News on Sunday, Fauci said that data clearly shows vaccination is key to fighting off the virus. That is really unfortunate because we know how effective vaccines are in preventing not only illness for the individual, but for diminishing the dynamics of the infection in society. He added that the pandemic will only be contained if the unvaccinated get on board. We still have approximately 66 million people who are eligible to be vaccinated who are not vaccinated. The degree to which we continue to come down in that slope will depend on how well we do about getting more people vaccinated. As of Sunday morning, the U.S. has given at least one dose to more than 65 percent of the population and 57 percent have been fully vaccinated. Experts believe that Merck's COVID-19 pills could save many more lives, especially in unvaccinated areas. But each course is priced at roughly 700 US dollars. And without a patent waiver, many experts are worried that we could see a repeat of vaccine inequality, where poor countries miss out once again. 
The antiviral pill Monopiravir, produced by U.S. drug maker Merck, is on course to become the first oral COVID-19 treatment. If the FDA grants it emergency use authorization, it could become a potential pandemic game changer by allowing patients to be treated without going to hospital. This is how it works. Once a patient tests positive, they can start a course of Monopiravir. That involves four capsules twice a day for five days, so a total of 40 pills. CNN reports that the U.S. agreed to pay $1.2 billion for 1.7 million courses if the pill is approved. That makes each course roughly $700. And according to Airfinity, 10 countries or territories are already in negotiations or have signed deals for the pills. Eight of them are in the Asia-Pacific region, including South Korea, New Zealand, and Australia. Experts believe these countries could be trying to avoid their past mistakes in vaccine purchases when their late grabs delay their inoculation programs. But experts caution that stockpiling by some countries could lead to a repeat of vaccine inequality, where wealthier countries were accused of hoarding doses as poor countries missed out. The nonprofit Doctors Without Borders emphasized that the treatment is a potentially life saving care in areas where many are unvaccinated. And they call for a patent waiver so that it can be produced all across the world. The raw materials are found to cost roughly $18 per course. Earlier in the pandemic, patent waivers for vaccines were rejected by a small number of governments. Thousands of people in El Salvador's capital took to the streets to protest against President Nayib Bukele over the Central American country's adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender and the firing of Supreme Court judges. Thousands marched in El Salvador on Sunday to air a range of grievances against President Nayib Bukele, from adopting Bitcoin as legal tender to firing Supreme Court judges, which has been viewed by his critics as a power grab. At least 4,000 people took to the streets in San Salvador, according to estimates by local media. Some carried banners and signs rejecting Bitcoin, which officially became legal tender in the Central American country in September. Others opposed the potential for Bukele to seek a second consecutive term. Near the capital's main square, protesters set fire to a doll bearing the likeness of the 40-year-old president. Last month, Bukele proclaimed himself dictator of El Salvador on his Twitter in an apparent joke amid concerns about his increasing concentration of power. In May, a Congress dominated for the first time by Bukele's New Ideas Party voted to fire the judges on the constitutional panel of the Supreme Court among the most senior jurists in the country. Replacements seen as friendly to the president were then swiftly voted in, which generated harsh criticism from the United States as well as top international rights groups. Bukele, a seasoned and often provocative user of social media, dismissed Sunday's protests on Twitter, saying, quote, the march is a failure and they know it. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Former U.S. President Bill Clinton walked out of a California hospital after being admitted last week. The 75-year-old will continue receiving treatment in his home state of New York. A rare water spout was spotted off the coast of Quinefuegos, Cuba. No damage was reported from the water spouts. Water spouts are often tornadoes that occur over a body of water but never reach land. NASA launched new space probe in a 12 years mission decided to visit more asteroids than ever before. It focuses on the Trojan asteroids, which are two large clumps of space rocks orbiting the Sun. Milan and Costa Rica were among the winners of the Earthshot Prize, an environmental award created by Britain's Prince William, who has criticized world leaders for an uninspiring response to the climate change crisis. Google's new phones, Pixel 6 and Pixel 6 Pro, will be released and may come with a new subscription option known as Pixel Pass. And finally tonight, an installation of nine giant wands was unveiled in central London to mark the 20th anniversary of the first Harry Potter film in the Wizarding franchise. 
The 15-foot-tall wands from The Wizarding World installed in London's Leicester Square are exact replicas used by nine characters from the Harry Potter and Fantastic Beasts series, including Harry Potter, Lord Voldemort, Albus Dumbledore, Ron Weasley, Hermione Granger, Newt Scamander, Tina Goldstein, Queenie Goldstein and Gellert Grindelwald. Standing on the site of the premiere of the first film, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, in 2001, the wands will illuminate in the square every evening with a 30-minute light show to the music of both series until October 25th. They also form part of the Inside Out Festival that brings art, entertainment and culture to the Westminster Borough of London. Year 7 children aged 11 from North London School Park View in Haringey perfected their swish and flick wand skills under the instruction of one choreographer Paul Harris who created the flight sequences in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, the fifth film in the Harry Potter series. Speaking about the magic of the wands used in the films, Harris said it was director David Yates of the 2007 film who first predicted that children would still be doing wand battle in years to come. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. Until then, I'm Anuradha Vikramasinghe. Stay safe and have a great night.